Okay, so Daphne, let's let's start at the beginning. Tell me how you and Jose met. Um, actually, we met on a Christian dating site. Um, I had just joined it. I was looking for friendship with people, and um, he was one of the gentlemen that had emailed me. We emailed for quite a while, and then um, he got my phone number, and we talked on the phone for a while, and then he asked to meet, and we met at Cantina Laredo and had dinner and talked for hours. We closed the place down. I was kind of like, wow, it's already that late. It was just the conversation was fascinating. Um, he had been a lot of places I have been and seemed to be a lot like what I have experienced in life. So it was like a connection. And I thought, wow, you know, what an interesting, fascinating man. So that's how we met. How long ago was that? Um, we met in February of 2011. After you started dating, I mean, he really had a, a, a pretty outstanding reputation in the community. He took you to a lot of different events. Oh yeah, I mean, it was like <laughs> it was like a a dream. I mean, everybody I worked with at work was like, "Oh my gosh, you know, he's an amazing man," and and you know, you're so lucky to be dating him. And and I mean, he took me to all kinds of awesome places, events. Um, Everybody I talked to, what, what an outstanding, amazing man he was. He was a, you know, a good businessman, and this is, he had owned a furniture store. He had a beautiful house. I mean, everything that was just like, wow, you know, what an amazing person and how lucky I am <laughs> to be with that person. This was a, a really a fairy tale for you. Tell me about your engagement and your, and your wedding. Oh, wow. <laughs> the engagement was definitely, um, it was very fast. Um, I think we'd only dated maybe three or four times before he was asking me to be exclusive. And I remember I was kind of surprised, but I thought, well, you know, at, at our age, you don't, you know, necessarily have to date for a long, long time before you just decide, because it's not like I'm dating around anyway. I'm not that type of a person. So it kind of caught me off guard, but I thought, well, you know, why not? Um, and then in, um, I don't know, it must have been maybe three or four months later that he said he had a big surprise for me and he was, uh, had rented this, you know, beautiful room and a bed and breakfast downtown and uh, we were, he took me out to dinner at the wine cellar. He had reserved a whole room where it was just us, so there would be complete privacy. There was a, a limousine that picked us up and took us to the restaurant. And um, when I walked into the restaurant, there was two dozen long-stemmed red roses on the table, and the owner met us, and he had selected the bottle of wine, and, and um, we had dinner, and, and then he started proposing to me, and as he was proposing, the lady from Underwoods came in with a silver tray, and on the tray was the engagement ring that he had already picked out. And I mean, I see her coming in with the tray and the ring, and he's proposing to me, and I was just totally blown away. I mean, it was just un over the top. <laughs> and uh, we had a bottle of champagne, we went into the limousine, had some more champagne, he took me to a Chicago concert. And I mean, it was just like, Wow, blew me off my feet. Wow, you're, you're very close with your family, your kids, your sister. Um, what did they all think about him in the beginning? Everybody liked him. I mean, everybody I talked to liked him. My daughter, Gabrielle, and my first granddaughter, Audrey, they, they came and lived with us at the house because um, she was moving from Texas. And, and, you know, he took her under wing and adored Audrey and, you know, he took he was like a dad to her and, you know, trying to help her out. Um, my, all my kids liked him. My family all thought he was an outstanding man. I, you know, wanted my family's approval, so I asked my, my sister to make sure, you know, and had her and her husband meet him to make sure, you know, he is a good person for me because, you know, I want my family to, to think it's a good thing too, and they were all very impressed. So it was, I mean, there was never any red flag, never any like, wow, be careful. 
everybody I talked to, his pastor, he had helped start the church with his, the pastor. I mean, everybody talked highly about him. Obviously, I mean, your heart is soaring, you're happy, you're on this amazing high and in love and engaged. And then all of a sudden, it just comes to a, an abrupt halt because he tells you that he's very sick. Yeah. What did he tell you? <laughs> um, we had actually, um, he had rented a house in North Carolina for Christmas. And I felt like things were not right because prior to that, um, he had acted very erratically, and I mean, it scared me because I was like, what the heck? It's, it's, it was like a behavior I had not seen in him before, and I didn't understand where that was coming from, so I was a little bit concerned and worried. And there were two events that had happened that really set alarm bells off. And then when we came back in January, uh, we were in the my bed in our bedroom and he had me in his arms and he told me that he had CJD and I was like I didn't even know what CJD was so I asked him I was like what is CJD and he's like it's a brain disease that you is there's no cure for and it's fatal and he said that he had six months thereabouts to live and I remember I bawled for hours in his arms, thinking he was dying. It was a lie. How does somebody do that? How can you lie and see your wife bawling, thinking you're dying? That's what I'm thinking when you're talking. How do you do that? He sees you sobbing, he sees you shaking. And he, that happened, went on for weeks. It wasn't, it was a long time I met with his doctor who verified he had CJD. I went to an MRI that he had of his brain. I asked over the phone, I talked to the doctor several times because I had so many questions. And he was supposed to be getting a treatment in Columbia that was cutting edge, wasn't sure if it would work. They couldn't do it here in the States because it wasn't approved. So this doctor was going to oversee it in Columbia in a hospital there. And all this time I'm thinking that this is really happening. Um, we, he came home one day and he was devastated. I mean, he was so upset. And he said that the, the thing with Columbia had fallen through and he couldn't have that treatment. And I mean, I was just like, Oh no, I mean, that was our only hope that we had. And he went up to North Carolina because he said he needed to be alone. And I was worried because he'd just gotten such bad news. And I thought, I was concerned that he might do something stupid. So he calls me the next day and he said he had tried to kill himself up there. And I called his son who was already up there at a wedding. And I told him, please go see your dad. I mean, he's tried to kill himself, and I was so concerned. And my daughter drove me up that day to the house up there, and, <laughs> and it was all a lie, all just for what? Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did you, was it really a doctor, or did he yeah. manipulate this? No, it was a doctor. Did he convince that doctor that he was sick? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea on that. I, that but, would probably be something you'd need to talk to. But you did come to find out, I mean, he was never sick. No, he didn't have CJD. He came to me, I, it was at least three weeks that, or a month that I was believing this. We even met with people that were going to try to help him to be able to do the treatment plan. It all, he came to me, I was in the kitchen, and he's, he came and said, I need to tell you something. So I sat down and he said, I wanted to let you know that all that CJD was a lie, and I really don't. And I was shocked, because I was like, what? He said, but there's a reason why I did that. I did that to protect you and the family. He's like, I didn't want you to find out, but I'm actually, there's a cartel, there was a CIA person who uncovered my secret files. I mean, he told me since we met 
that he was in the special ops when he was younger and that he had done different missions with the special ops in South America. I mean, from the beginning, he'd been telling me about that. His kids, he'd even lied to them. They even thought he was in the special ops. I mean, he'd been doing that for years, telling everything about that. So he said that one of the CIA agents had come across his top secret file and was bribing him, blackmailing him, saying that if he didn't pay them, he would be going to the cartel and telling them because he had taken out one of the cartel's leaders in South America. This he had told me from the beginning. And the son and the wife had survived. So the son was now running that cartel in South America and in Mexico. It was supposedly a huge cartel. I don't know much about that sort of thing. So I just, I believed what he said. Why would you, why would you lie about that? And he said that this agent was blackmailing him and he had a friend also in the CIA that he had gone to and he was like, keep paying the blackmail. We're, gonna, we're trying to locate who the agent is so we can find out and put a stop to it, find out how far he went, did the cartel know. But he said that in the meantime, because they didn't know how much of the cartel knew if it had gotten to the sun, that our lives would be in danger and that he had to die because that would be the only way the cartel would back off if they did know. Because if he just disappeared, the first people they would come to would be the family and try to, you know, either hurt us to get information or use us as hostages to make him come forward. So he said he had to die. That was the only way that he could protect us. And I had to help him because it was for the safety of my, our children, and I will do anything to help my children, especially if I think their lives are in danger. And why would I think that he would lie about something like that? Why would you make up something like that? I mean, that's sick. So I had to help him, and he left two days later, I think, for Venezuela. He said he was going to go to Cuba. And he had a cousin in the Cuban government who would help him. And they would try to get this cartel taken care of and find out how far it went. Apparently, the friend of his from the CIA had found out who the rogue agent was. And they had tried to find out from him. And he had said that he had contacted the cartel in Mexico, but they hadn't contacted the son yet. So it was still not safe. but. How far had it gotten would it, before it gets to the sun? So that's why all of this came about. So when he got to Venezuela, he would email me. And he emailed that he had met a CIA agent in Venezuela and that, you know, that she had said she was going to help him. And, you know, they were going to take this, get this taken care of in Mexico. And then he emailed and said that she just was called back for some strange reason, that the CIA wasn't going to help him now, and that, you know, he still had his friend in the CIA who would help, but that the actual agency, the agent who was there, was not going to be involved. So he was going to turn to the Cubans to help get the cartel taken care of in Mexico. How, at what point into your relationship is this? Is this a year in or a little? He left a month before our first year anniversary. So about a year and a half? Yes. And at this point, he's, he starts asking you to help him. Yeah. And, and at this point, you know you're going to have to do things. I had to lie to, help to my family, and I've never lied to my kids or my family. And I think that was the hardest thing because I hated having to lie to them and deceive them. But I thought I was protecting them and keeping them from harm. And if I shared with them, it would put them in danger. And I couldn't do that. You couldn't risk them telling anyone. Right. Because he kept saying it had to be the CIA was helping. It had to stay within there because otherwise the cartel would come after us and my family, and I didn't want that. 
so I know we know from from the stories that we've done from this point you go down you you know you help you you do the things that that we went that wind up getting the charges against you but let's kind of fast forward a little bit to then he gets caught um tell me how how, how did he get caught and then let's start talking about how it all just started unraveling again i had gone up for a while, I had been telling him I couldn't do this anymore. I had gotten an email from the CIA agent that the cartel was taken out. They even sent me newspaper clippings that showed that they had been taken out. So I knew we were now safe. The only thing... So he, so he basically found a similar storyline. Apparently. <laughs> and started sending you stuff to make you believe that that was his storyline. Apparently. And all the emails from the CIA agent were not from, apparently, the CIA agent. Apparently, there was no CIA agent. It was all him manipulating. So you were saying that you started telling him, I can't do this anymore. I couldn't. And what we were waiting for, because he had promised me from the beginning that all the money would be paid back, that the insurance money that paid out, I, had, I told him, I said, you have to pay it back. You owe all these people, all these debts and loans that I found out about, and, uh, and the banks and, and the lawyers, I mean, everybody who was helping. I said, you, you've got to pay it back. And he had promised that he would. But I got tired of waiting, and I told him, I can't do this anymore. I can't lie anymore. It's too much. And he promised that he was going to turn himself in to the FBI. He said he would. And that's when, apparently, he had been applying for a passport under his assumed name, which he had told me the CIA had given him this contact that gave him the fake ID. And apparently, he had applied for a passport. So I can only wonder, where were you going to go? You obviously weren't going to turn yourself in if you're getting a passport. And we were in the Jeep, going to his Jeep, because he also had an old Jeep, because he was going to come down separately and meet me with the kids, because he was going to tell family the truth before he turned himself in. And that's when these agents, he was going to his Jeep, and he had always told me for the whole year that we were going through this, he'd always said, if anybody asks, I'm this Ernest Wills or whatever the name was, he always drummed into me that I couldn't let people know who he was. So when the agents came and stopped and took him, the agent came up and asked me. So I did what he had always told me to do. That's my friend, Ernest Wills, <laughs> which of course they already knew and he said, we know that's Jose Lantigua, your husband, and you've lied to us, so that's a, that's a federal charge. <laughs> so I was charged, but they let me go, and I came back to tell my family the truth about what I thought was the truth, and that I had been lying to save them, to protect them. I still thought that was the truth. <laughs> And it wasn't. No, it took me eight months before I finally believed my lawyer. I, I kept telling him, you don't have to worry. The CIA is going to show that this is all the truth. <laughs> it's going to come out the truth. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> Daphne, what, I mean, what was the day that you, that it really hit you? That I that, finally believed? That this was all just this calculated web of lies. It wasn't until my lawyer came and told me that Jose had admitted that it was all a lie. And that's when I found out that I was just manipulated and lied to by my own husband. I would have never dreamed that he would do that. I don't understand how you can do that to somebody you love, much less your wife that you called your soulmate. How do you do that? 
and for so long. Did you try to get answers straight from him? No. No, I didn't want to. I don't. I still don't want anything to do with him. I want. I'm hoping and praying my divorce comes through soon, and I never want to see him again. Because everything was a sham, a lie. Why? What would it matter what he says? You can't. Mm -hmm. You can't justify what he did. No amount of story. I mean, and it would be another lie. No, there's nothing I have to say to him. In addition to the heartache, the countless weeks that you've sat here and just, just from the time I've known you and talked to you and just, you know, still been a state of disbelief that this happened. Um, you have lost so much because of what happened and so much because of believing him. He's destroyed my life. He has destroyed my life. He's hurt my family, my children. I mean, what he has done to countless peoples. I mean, there's a whole line of people he has hurt and, and tried to devastate. And I think one of the hardest things is that people believe that you truly conspired with him. What is that like for you? What do you want to say to, to those people? I don't think anything I say will change their mind. My consolation, and this was through counseling, my, my pastor counseled me and he said, Daphne, the people who know you know you're not that person. They know the truth about you and what you are. And my God knows the truth. And I still believe that he will show the truth. I really do. I believe that the truth will speak to some people. Even the prosecutor in this case said that he believed, that he really believed you were hoodwinked. He said that he believed that you were just sucked in, brainwashed, and that you really just wanted to do the right thing. Yeah. Did that give you a little bit of redemption and, a, and just, a, did that give you a little bit of something back? That was a God thing. That was definitely a God thing. I spent 16 months in hell, in jail. And every day I would pray and stand that God would vindicate me, that he would bring out the truth and that he would set me free because that's what his promises in the word said. And I believed those. And there were days it was really hard to believe it because nothing was happening. So when I heard after the interrogation, and it was quite a three hour mm -hmm. interrogation that I had with the prosecutor, and that he finally believed the truth about me, it was God. It, it, was, it was an anchor, something thrown, a life safe wrap thrown out to me, because it was like, thank you, Jesus. The truth is coming out. Because of this, a lot of women have reached out to you who have, who have been with, who have similar stories. Oh, yeah. Not, maybe not as detailed, you know, as this, but, um, but they've reached out to you because they've believed someone who just continually lied to them. Um, have you been able to help them? I mean, do you feel like this is, it, it's, it's hard to define a purpose from this because the time in jail, all the things that you've gone through, the fact you know, house arrest and, and, and everything else, it's, it's hard to find a reason. But I know you're a woman of faith and there always is one. I do you feel like this has something to do with it, helping other women? I do. That's the main reason I'm doing this interview. I'm prayed a long time because this is totally over my comfort zone. I'm terrified doing interviews 
but I really feel that if my story can help just one woman not go through what I went through, it would be worth it. Because I don't, there's so many women out there who trust and believe what a man tells them, especially when it's verified by society. He seems like such an amazing man. I, if anything I say will bring off any alarms to them, to help them, even just to, whoa, wait, you know, maybe, then it would be worth it if I could have helped just one woman. It's, 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 it's interesting though, and it's difficult because I don't think it's an issue of you being, for lack of a better word, stupid with him <laughs> or being naive or what they would say, love is blind. I think in some cases it's just a, being a, a good person. You went to church together. You, you did devotionals together every we day. We prayed and did devotions every day. So how do you, I mean, how do you even see this coming? <laughs> I didn't. And all I can say is for somebody in my situation, even when you really firmly believe that they are Christian and they're good, we went to church together. His pastor spoke highly of him. But if there's anything that just seems a little bit off, or if it's something they have you do that's not what God says to do, watch, be careful. For you, the only thing that he really did along those lines was he tried to start separating you from your family. Yeah. Talk to me about that. And he, he, he started getting a little controlling. Yeah, well, um, with him telling me about the cartel, obviously I couldn't tell my family. I couldn't ask their advice. I couldn't ask their opinion. I couldn't go to them when I was scared or confused or anything. He was the only person I could go to. So whenever I was scared or I was confused or I thought, whoa, you know, this is just, I can't do this, it's not right. He would always convince me that this was a good thing to do because it was protecting the family. And he always, I mean, he was very, very suave, very smooth. He would always have an explanation, always have an answer, and always, you know, bring out scriptures. <laughs> when was the last time you saw him? The day he got arrested. I was arrested that night here in Florida. I, have, I saw him when we were interrogated. We were in the same room at the beginning. 